Hey, everyone. Welcome to this week's episode of the AdQuick Advertising Podcast. Today, I am super excited to have a special guest, Amanda Natividad. I think I said that right. Um, I actually wrote in our show notes, Amanda Spark Toro, which is where she works. She's such a great voice um, in the digital marketing industry. She has a storied background at a number of household brands, such as Fitbit. Um, she's one of the nicest marketers in the space. You know, marketers sometimes get a little bit of a hard time for some of us are a little snarky and, you know, m- might be a little bit, um, we, we, we've seen a little too much. And Amanda has seen all the things that we have seen too, and has maintained a positive vibe and a positive attitude. She's one of my favorite people. And I'm excited to bring her on the podcast today. Welcome, Amanda. Thank you so much for spending the time. I know how busy you are. Oh my gosh, thank you for having me and thank you for that incredibly generous intro. Um, great. And so for people who don't know you, um, you know, tell us just your super brief background and what you do for Spark Toro. Yeah. So let's see. Um, I guess, at th- I mean, at this point, I mean, I'm kind of old. Um, I'm a longtime marketer, probably over 10 years now. But um, if if anybody knows me, like on this, anyone tuning in who knows me, they probably have seen that I've kind of only um, been more well known in the recent like two years, maybe. So a lot of behind the scenes work, mostly in content marketing, um, a little bit in the performance side, but as well as PR events. So I've kind of seen it all, um, but mostly I'm a content marketer. And now I'm at SparkToro, which is an audience research startup. So we help marketers find their audience's sources of influence, which means like social accounts they follow, podcasts they listen to, subreddits that they engage with, and all that good stuff. Awesome. So in terms of today's episode, let's just dive into some hot topics. I sent an agenda over, but you know, when we're talking about influence, let's go into that. So I think... Influencer marketing seems like one of those opportunities that's a little bit like a nuclear bomb or just, nu- sorry, nuclear energy. It's either this awesome force for your company or it's like a nuclear bomb that can blow things up. And so we've seen a few examples of that going the other direction lately, whether it is um, companies doing TikToks where the influencer speaks about probably something inappropriate to um, wider things that just end up happening with partnerships. Um, in terms of Spark Turo, you know, you guys are the the pickaxes and shovels, right? You're not really accountable to what a company actually does once they identify influencers. But can you speak to a little bit how you are advising brands, large and small, to, to sort of navigate what may not be new territory for someone like yourself, but perhaps is new territory for certain types of brands and teams? Yeah, so I think... A lot of what we say, and I don't even know if this distinction is helpful for a lot of people, but it is to us, which is we tend to say influence or source of influence, not influencer. And then just the nuance being that we don't want to um, we don't want to mislead anybody into thinking like, oh, you use our tool to find like the hottest people on TikTok. Like that's not what you well also like our our tools don't crawl TikTok, at least not yet. Um So we say sources of influence, which may or may not be individuals, right? It could be publications, other websites, could be like YouTube YouTube channels that aren't necessarily individuals. So the things that influence your audience, which may or may not be people. So that's kind of the main thing. Um, So if anybody says like, oh, I tried to I tried to use you guys to find like good Instagram influencers. You guys weren't good for that. We would we would say like, yeah, because we don't really do that. Like you can find some influential social accounts in a given niche, but they might not be the kind of traditional like content creator influencer that you might be looking for. Okay. And in terms of, you know, Spark Turo and your tool. So what you're saying is, you know, you guys are just helping build a broader list for a company to at least understand who's talking about your product or your category or industry to build relations with. I think you guys are mostly on the on the organic marketing side, but yeah. I, I guess could be the paid marketing side as well if you've created partnerships. Um, I think a lot of the I, I think a lot of the problems currently arise from something your tool does help, 
which is understanding, you know, who these people are, what their motivations are, um, probably, you know, not just the demographics behind them, but like their actual psychographic reach and influence, right? So I think like a, a research tool like SparkToro would help a brand to understand better and not do something that results in a big PR disaster later. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. And the other way I look at it too is like, right. I say, I said audience research, right. It's like, you know, I like to compare it against keyword research where keyword research will show you the high volume search terms, what people are searching for online, but it's audience research that tells you who's searching for it or why they are, what they're looking for. It gives you more of that context behind why people are doing things. And then I imagine that there's a, a handful of things, Amanda, that like surveys and interviews just don't do well, right? And right, so yeah, totally. Because like, there's also that difference between what people say they do and what they actually do, right? They <laughs> might be like, I, I read the Wall Street Journal and you're like, no, bro, you read Morning Brew. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> or here, I mean, or it's very impractical to be like, hey, let me export my search history, my browser search history so you can see where <laughs> right. I go. So yeah, I totally, totally get it. Yeah. So Amanda, before you came on, um, you wanted to talk a little bit about a subject that we have gotten into um, online a few times. And I think Chris has strong opinions here held strongly, which would be the phrase I hate, growth hacking. Mm -hmm. um, I personally don't think marketers should be hacking anything. I think we should be connecting and building relationships. Maybe it's it, maybe it's purely use of words that we're that we're quibbling over. But um, do you want to talk about some ways that companies can use social growth tactics in a way that wouldn't result in you know the the, the sort of user frustration or people to feel like they're being spammed, right? Because nobody wants that. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So I think like. I think as we talk about this, we might even find that we agree more than we disagree. And I agree that like, yeah, nobody should be hacking anything. Um, but I think what I, what, what's been on my mind is the broader discourse around it, like what people hate about it, the way people are railing against it, um, who's doing it, who's not doing it. So I have a bunch of little quibbles with it. And I think one of them, starting with the brand or company side, is... Of course, I'm not saying don't hack your way to success. Of course, I'm not saying go be unethical. Like, no, don't do not do that. But I think a lot of times when we as marketers are railing against the growth hacks and saying don't do it that way, that's terrible. Um, I think we're sort of, I think we're missing the bigger picture, right? Because I think there's something to be said for understanding these growth hacks or social tactics or just the, the things that we kind of feel sort of icky about. I think if you just fully denounce it as like, I hate this thing, I'm not even going to look at it. I think you're going to miss out on a lot of potential actual growth or learning opportunities, right? Because it's not so much like, like, you know, we've all seen that the Twitter hook of like, these 50 websites are so good, they should be illegal. Like, I, I don't like that. That's not my style. However, I think there's something we can learn from that. And I don't think the learning is necessarily, oh, it's because like stupid shit works and people like that. I think there's something to be said for, well, the, it's, it's written with like direct response copy in mind, right? It's fine. It's, it's uncovering some kind of pain point. It's making the reader feel like, oh, I really need to know this. And then from there, it's thinking about, well, how can I think about it this way and apply it to my company or my brand in a way that is actually on brand and helpful to our audience? Sure. I, I think for, um, for an individual mm -hmm. to use direct marketing copy in social, to me, feels antithetical to social. Like mm -hmm. at that point, shouldn't you just be writing an email newsletter or a blog or something? Like, I, I think that's where a lot of the um, the other marketers, their sort of marketing immune system goes up and they're like, you know, this isn't like that channel, right? Where this is sort of the water cooler of the internet or for LinkedIn, I guess the water cooler of, of the business world a little bit is what, what it should be in like a healthy state, in my opinion. But mm -hmm. I think it's like, you're sort of consciously using tactics that, um, I, I, 
I think some people, some people would argue that's why people don't like marketers in social. Man, and I could fair. be wrong and you could be closing <laughs> tons of business and be like, Adam is just a purist with social and you shouldn't listen to him and you, you know, should do these things because you're getting so many leads. Um, but I think that the, the, I, I, I do like that we agree on the things like, oh, this website should be illegal or <laughs> um, 99% of people are doing something wrong. I heard rumors that that <laughs> oh might God. be something you joked oh. about somewhere and now everyone used it. So the internet, should we, should we be bl blaming Amanda for, for that might. small? <laughs> Maybe small we should. Because I, I did write that hook. And like when I started seeing that everywhere, I was like, God, I, and I was like, oh, yeah, haha. And then I was like, who came up with that first? And I remember I searched for it on Twitter to be like, who did that first? And I think it was me. And I was like, oh my God. It, and I, I, it was a it was like a tongue-in-cheek um like thread that I wrote. And it was sort of in response to like, you know, everyone does these, they don't do as much anymore, but you know, those threads of like people to follow, like, oh, follow those people for the most valuable or whatever. Um, and there was this long, there has been this long time trend of people only mentioning men right so i just kind of like took a similar sort of over the top bro -y hook but like only included women in the thread <laughs> and it went like really it went very viral like i think some of the women got like i think over i think a couple thousand followers from it so it was kind of incredible um but it was like a dual purpose right <laughs> it was like for the greater good but and anyway i was sort of like oh god i think i was i was responsible for that i'm sorry love, internet <laughs> no i love it i i think it's hilarious that your your sort of meme that was making fun of of a certain content archetype then was like eaten by the same type of growth hacky spam people and it's like now become like a thing that they're using in earnest i think it that's kind of amazing right mm -hmm. um so in terms of maybe we could find a middle ground here yeah in, ter in terms of how you as an individual interact online or you as a company like I think actually when when companies are using more direct marketing or advertising copy like my at least for, even removing my marketing hat like I sort of expect that from a company and so mm -hmm. I, I think like companies could use those tactics I I guess um, when individuals do, I, I'm just going to say it. I think it, it depends on what your end goals are. So like if your goal is to sell 500,000, you know, if you want like 500,000 people subscribe to your newsletter for AI tips and, and that's your model, I, I actually will say go ahead and, you know, lean into whatever cliches and whatever archetypes work. But on the other hand, if you were trying to do that and then you were trying to sell someone like myself um, if I were a CMO at a large company, I would look at you online and be like, you're not a serious person and probably not hire you. So I think like you sort of disqualify yourself from, from certain conversations and you might open yourself up to others. I think that's a hard pivot to decide to do both. Um, mm -hmm. so, so I, I'm actually not saying don't use certain tactics. I'm just saying like you end up becoming the brand that you build. And so if you want to be yeah. someone who's built on clickbait, then whatever you're selling also better be clickbait. Like it'd probably be pretty hard to grow an audience like that and then sell enterprise software. Like, like all of your threads are so thoughtful and smart that like everyone takes you really seriously when you're talking about your product. So I think like my warning for marketers would be um, wh whatever you're doing to try to get the industry together from especially a thought leadership standpoint, like just takes, who cares? But like, mm -hmm. just remember like, you you're gonna have to sell into these people later and they're gonna remember when you when you sort of game the system for them and i, I don't think people like being gamed on social that's my yeah. that's my only takeaway yeah no i think that's a really good point i i mean totally agree it depends right it depends on what you're selling it depends on how you're selling it um maybe taking the side of like here's how to do it in a way that is probably less spammy and shitty it, or like in a way it's probably more respectable is Look at, you know, look at the hooks or the things that go viral and try to reverse engineer it from, from very basic first principles, which is like what tends to go viral or like at, high, at least high engagement, we'll say that. And it tends to be things that are like counterintuitive, um, totally novel. So like fresh, novel, original insights, um, 
things that are written very like clearly and just you know we'll say copy written clearly in the sense of like simple words not too verbose right like simple sentences where you can easily skim it as people are going through social you can take those things and still write something or sell something that is totally respectable right i think that's one way to look at it and then the other side the thing that you're saying about like if you're selling like clickbait or if you're being clickbaity you better sell clickbait i agree and i also think we can tie this back to the whole influencer marketing discussion. Like if you are looking for influencers on social media to partner with, and let's say, let's say, let's call out Twitter and LinkedIn, just because those are kind of like the text-based platforms that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a lot of like you and I are off are often like lurking on, right? It's, I would caution people to, if you're considering working with any of these influencers on these social accounts is, really look at their engagement and their comments and who's following them. And like, when I say look at it, I mean like, well, what are the comments that you're seeing, seeing on their content? Who's saying these things, right? Because then if you look closely, you, then you might find, oh, this person sure has a large, has like 500,000 followers. And sure, they're real people. Like, I mean, we all have some bots who follow us, right? But I mean, by and large, they didn't buy their followers. But you'll probably see like, oh, based on this behavior, like the comments people are making, so like the general profile of these, of, or like of these people who are following, they're, they're not the audience that's going to buy from me. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to partner with them. Or right? like they could be a real following, but do they have dollars? <laughs> Yeah, or or you start digging into the comments and you start seeing things in Cyrillic and in Mandarin. <laughs> right. You're like, oh, that's actually not my target market, right? Yeah. Um, I'm not too uh, – I'm kind of far removed from the, the influencer uh, space right now, but is that still going strong? Where, where, kind of where is that at right now? Do I we... think so. I mean, I guess like – I don't know what ad spend for influencers has been like this year. Um Last year, I was seeing that it was a little bit easier to secure some sponsorships and was talking with friends who were like, you know, securing their own sponsors and stuff. And I think was it like last year that Ahrefs kind of famously was like, we're going to like go all in on creator marketing or influencer marketing. Um, this year, I don't really know what a lot of people are doing. I feel like a lot of people are kind of scared and they're like, I don't want to spend so much. So I'm going to say I kind of don't know, but. It's still there, I think. People are still spending some money on this. You know, I think the UGC playbooks have maybe have reached their peak and they're trying to figure out what the next uh, algo juicing tactic is, the next growth hack. Right? Probably, yeah. <laughs> well, we had um, Trung Fan on the podcast and he actually does like, he, he, he actually does really interesting threads. And I think he, he said something that stuck with me and he's like, look, you can have AI tools, like copy any of like, the thread bro things or, or, you know, come up with content, quote unquote. And he's like, the one thing the AI can't do is be funny and have a personality and create mm -hmm. memes. Like it's just not there. And he's basically, he's, he's made the case that that's like the final boss for like who you care about connecting to online. It's like, you know, not that they have followed some, you know, growth hacking playbook and they have 500 K followers. Like who cares about that? Um, they, they actually have a personality that you want to connect with them. You want to, you know, at the end of the day, especially for B2B, it's in commodified spaces, you give business to people that that you like and, and you want to work with. You know, you have options in those spaces. Unless you're like, you know, Spark Toro, where you have the best product and there's not really any competitors, and then you have to work with Amanda, which is awesome. Um, <laughs> but for for everyone else, it's like, you know, if you are in sort of one of these red ocean markets, like in B two B, I think being out there as an individual connecting with the market is such a great way to to connect with people. I think like when you see like the rank and file of a team is empowered to be out there and they're passionate enough to talk about their sector and they're talking about, you know, their, their software and things like that. I think it adds a layer of credibility versus these companies where it's like monoliths, like, yeah. you know, who's even working there? Like, are they just, you know, are they fully like outsourcing to the cheapest people possible that don't even have opinions online? Right. I think like it adds to such credibility um, for, I think like I've always said that social is more valuable for B2B than B2C. 
And I, I think we're slowly people are getting there, but mm. um, you know, products like yours help. Yeah, I think, yeah, thank you for that. And to that point on like AI, like it can't be funny, like, cause it's not human, right? Like I think, I think where I'm, where I have some cautious optimism around it is my hope is that as shitty writers adopt more AI stuff, then it enables the better writers to stand out even more, right? Because then yeah. you're like better writers know to like use personal stories or just they have their own tone and their own style, their own perspectives that they infuse throughout their writing. And, you know, I'm op I, I hope that we see more people just trying to find their voice and trying to convey their styles, I'd say. Yeah. Um, I want to shift gears a little bit. So as part of your job, you talk to a lot of marketing leaders across industries and, you know, across the sectors. And so I think we've been trying to, and, and a lot of people are trying to assess the sort of the, the current state of marketing leadership tech sophistication. And I think we all, uh, you know, talk with our set of, of users and clients and we listen to company earnings calls and uh, people speak at events, but I'm curious, you know, what's like the current state of, of our leadership in terms of, of really getting, uh, you know, tech tools and, and, you know, really using the products that all of us are, are trying to sell best. Yeah. Um, a lot of what I'm seeing is I, th I feel like, and could be, you know, my bias or whatever, but I feel like I'm seeing a lot more marketing leaders be a little bit more open to marketing tactics that are difficult to attribute. Like, I think people are starting to kind of, you know, accept like, okay, third party cookies going away, dark social, all these things. Um, and they're starting to feel like, okay, I kind of get it. Like I, or obviously this content thing is working out for you. Maybe we should try it that way. Right. Like I think people are starting to be more open to trying new things, um, being a little bit more comfortable with not measuring everything. Right. And accepting that there are just some things that you do to elevate your brand that will end up paying dividends eventually. Right. Might not see ROI immediately, but trusting the process. Right. And seeing that like this will we'll get some ROI eventually. I, I feel like we're starting to see more of that openness. Are, are you? What do you think? Yeah, um, we're, I mean, we're kind of going the other way in that uh -huh. we're really trying to help marketers measure a tactic that has mm -hmm. historically been really hard to measure out of home ads. Yeah. And um, actually, I loved your piece you wrote on zero click content because really our, like a lot of our types of ads are it's zero click. You know, you see it, you, you, you might take a, a photo of it. You know, our, our ads are actually the one ad format that gets consistently shared on social every day. And, uh, but can you go into a little bit of what you mean by zero click content for people who haven't heard of this concept and what it means for them? Yeah. So zero click content is, so it's a combination of a couple things. I, I, I basically just say it, this is standalone content that has value on its own where no further context is needed. No further information is needed. However, it is better if you click. Right. So it's, it could be as some, it, and tactics of doing this or ways of doing this are creating native to platform content. Right. So, like Twitter threads, LinkedIn posts, uh, Instagram carousels or reels. Right. Those are things that are native to the platform for which you, you can provide that standalone value. And what I'm not saying is, I'm not saying never link out or, you know, never include a link. It's that it's acknowledging that, you know, a lot of these platforms, well, like Twitter and LinkedIn, they throttle links, right? If you if you post them directly in your post for channels like or platforms like Instagram and TikTok, you can't even put links in your captions, right? Like it like you you're you're kind of forced to repurpose the content to be native to that given platform. And to that point, you know, when when as I've been collecting ideas of zero click content, right? Like my, my most, for me, the most obvious one is Twitter threads, like repurposing your blog post into a thread, right? Where it's basically a summary of your blog post. And then at the very end, dropping the link and saying, like, if you want to read more in depth, here's my blog post. And the funny thing is that 
people will consume the thread because it's already native to Twitter because nobody's opening Twitter in hopes of leaving Twitter, right? They're there because they want to be there. And then they can decide for themselves after getting that standalone value, oh, I do want to learn more, or I'm going to save this for later, or I will click on this thing. Um, but the funny thing is, as I was collecting examples of this, I was realizing, like, really the first examples of this in marketing are out-of-home ads, right? The billboards that have that standalone, like, I might have, like, a recipe for something, or it makes sense out of context when you're just driving past it. That's standalone value. And I get it. Value is subjective, right? Like, everybody wants different things. But the whole point of a billboard <laughs> is to stand out on its own. Right. You don't need, you shouldn't have to Google like, oh, what's Coca-Cola. Right. Yeah. I, I think it's super interesting because for online marketers, I think they might have too many metrics and too many KPIs. And then the reverse is true. Offline marketers haven't had enough really good metrics. And so you, it's interesting, a lot of what you advise, and, and I know you're, you're helping companies with this, with a lot of your tools and we are as well on the sort of the, the sort of brand lift side and like, okay, seeing a lot of those organic channels as directional versus, oh, you know, you need to campaign tag every link and oh my God, someone shared something that wasn't attributed, right? It's like, you can almost get two in the weeds with a lot of your tactics versus seeing, you know, a, like the broader lift of building a company, which, which I want marketers to get back to because we all know that it's not, you know, a single play. It's, you know, a marathon, right? You're, you're not just running the short sprint. You're trying to, you know, win this big long race. And if you, everything matter, everything is, you know, contingent upon this one short-term campaign. And if you're in a company where that's the case, you're probably in some trouble, right? You know, if like you're relying on this one campaign in this one quarter, um, you might want to, you might want to start looking for other jobs just in case, <laughs> but yeah, it's, 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 um, it's an interesting time for marketing. Cause I think we've, we've over indexed on metrics and analytics and maybe haven't asked why enough times. And, um, on the other hand for out of home marketers, I think they haven't had enough visibility. So it's a sort of opposite problem where they need better data so they can go back and get more money. You know, it's like, it's not really hard for a digital marketer to, you know, buy us a case for more budget for a given platform. Um, we're trying to help with out of home. So, mm -hmm. you know, different problems, but I, I think we all want to arrive at the same solution. Like, you know, these really good brand metrics are, would think, be things like brand lift and, you know, these things that are proxies for the success of your marketing more broadly, whether someone clicks a link or clicks through a social update or sees a billboard or not. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or takes completely an action on it or not. Yeah, completely agree. I completely agree. And like, um, I mean, out of home is really one of the best examples of this, of this thing that's like, ah, it's too hard to attribute, but the best out of home marketers know how to do it. I don't know how to do it. I just have worked with people who do and they do it really, really well. So it is possible, but it's not like, oh, we had to track, by, track it by the page views and the bounce rate. And like, like no, like that's not how any of that works. And I think the thing with zero click content, and, and what I'll also say is a common sort of question slash maybe complaint that I get about it is, oh, so you're saying we just shouldn't track anything. And I'm like, I'm not saying don't track anything. I'm just saying that like, you know, not your, like, what I'm saying is there are other ways to track things and there are other ways to see the bigger yeah. picture. And, you know, that's where I do think that things like the typical van vanity metrics can be really impactful. Like, even if you just look at it as if you're creating a piece of content, like, right, like a blog post or something, then in general, right, in general, the goal is to have as many people see it as possible and be influenced by it. And one way, to, one way to do that is to optimize impressions for it. And if you're just dropping links in your platforms and saying, oh, so excited for my latest blog post, but no one's going to read that. And so you're not going to get the impressions. So it's sort of like, I'm not saying, hey, impressions are all that matter. It's, well, if you're going to optimize for impressions and you're doing things like optimizing for, or like making sure that, you know, you're content is addressing a really salient pain point that somebody's feeling that you're making it really palatable for them to read you're making it easy for them to consume and all those things can help you get more impressions which over time right get you brand lift um get you recognition boost your credibility in the space 
Yeah, as I like to joke with uh, with some of our prospects, our some of my peers, some of our peers, I should say, is uh, the uh, the tr- the brand marketers, the traditional marketers that you know are are accustomed to doing mass reach stuff. They need to brush up on their acronyms that start with R and C's. And then uh, for my performance and growth marketers, uh, you need to dust off the textbook and start learning your four P's again. Because uh, strangely enough, uh, what what's uh, old is new again. Yeah. And so we're finding, you know. You we're finding uh, people who used to be hardcore, I think, oh, hardcore performance marketers now just going fully on brand. Uh, Airbnb is a great example of this. And, uh, but absolutely, that's how you need to think about zero, uh, zero click content. And like, um, who's doing, oh, what, what's his name? Oh, Dan Toomey from uh, Morning Brew does this really well, where they'll tee up a little snippet and uh, watch the full video on YouTube. Obviously no clicks, but um, I imagine that that channel is getting going gangbusters because of the quality of stuff that they put out. Probably, yeah. Yeah, I, I also think that, you know, what you're talking about, Amanda, you know, respecting top of funnel, right? I, I do think there's a certain breed of marketer, the, the heart and direct marketing person that only cares about the conversion and revenue. And it's like, they kind of ignore all the things that, that, that lead to that, right? Like, mm-hmm. it could, and, and I think we've seen some teams over optimize on, you know, the lower part of the funnel, some on the upper part. I think with all of the privacy tracking getting blown up, you're going to have to, I, I think any company needs a healthy mix of both, unless you're just selling funny t-shirts and it's a super simple conversion and it's just, Hey, we have this ad, this t-shirt's funny. You're going to buy it. But if it's anything more than something simple like that, um, and you are going through the effort of engaging with people online and building relationships, I think, um, you, you said it pretty well. You need to respect the whole funnel. Um, can you share a little bit if, if I'm, a, I guess, either a junior marketer or a marketer on a team with executives who, who don't really get metrics? Do, do you have any sort of couple key takeaways that if they could internalize to help educate their bosses, that, that would help their life? Yeah. Um, let's see. I mean, I, I kind of, when it comes to metrics, I'm sort of like on the side of fewer the better, honestly. <laughs> like, I just, I don't like to look at a bunch of the stuff. And I think it's kind of a waste of time to spin your wheels trying to track everything. So maybe the first thing I would say is work with your manager or across your team to identify a couple, like, this is something that um, Kaylee Edmondson has talked about. It's called common current common currency, right? Like find the common currency across your team, like a couple of metrics or KPIs that everybody can agree on um, and then focus on those. And so it's going to vary like just based on the kind of marketing that you're doing, right? Like if you're primarily a content marketer, then um, probably a lot of these, I think the common currency metrics are going to be probably overall page views uh, referral traffic or like who's like, how are you like who's how are people getting to your to your site or to these pages um, understanding that a lot of these social networks are making it hard to attribute right like we're seeing that dark social is a very real thing and we're probably vastly undercounting how many referrals we're actually getting from a lot of these other platforms um, that might be one if you're on social like some of these metrics that are going to be important are probably going to be overall engagement, right? And I don't know how impactful or like how how much follower growth really truly matters, right? Because sometimes, um, and this is uh, based on like people I've talked to and asked directly, like sort, sort of polling people is uh, I've learned that a lot of people are looking at company social media accounts just to see if they're posting because something that they're looking for as a consumer is, is this company actually in business? Or like, are they are they posting regularly? Are there signs of life here? Oh, there are. Okay, cool. Maybe I'm going to buy it from them, right? That's something you can't really track. So sometimes a KPI can be the output itself. Like, are we actually doing something on this channel? Um, but yeah, and I think maybe the other thing is but I think is most important is having some KPIs or metrics that are shared across marketing functions, right? Like email marketing to blog content. Like are these two like interacting together? I think those are pretty important because it shows 
like alignment across teams. It shows it's it's a lot easier to attribute from your own email list, right? If people are actually clicking on your site or clicking on the things that you want them to click on. Um, so maybe I would say that. Awesome. So we talked about metrics. We talked a little bit about, um, you know, brand reputation, not to spam your users, growth hacking. Um, can you share, because you follow so many like interesting, like large and small brands, who is doing a really kick-ass job in social? And can you share like a few stories of why and people we should follow to sort of get some inspiration? Oh, fun. Uh, well, a lot of my world is B2B, right? So I think, I think Databox is doing a really good job on LinkedIn. Like I think they're doing a really good job with just like, creating interesting content that I actually want to read. <laughs> like a lot of it is based on things that they're testing, things that they're experiencing and they're sharing their insights. And I, I just, it's original to me. I think it's interesting. And also the way that they're empowering the individuals at, at Databox to post like as themselves on LinkedIn. Like I think it's, I think it's cool like to see more of these person led brands, right? Where we've, we've talked about this a little bit earlier, right? Kind of like people, I don't know, people like to follow people, not so much brands. And I think Databox does a good job of like balancing the two. Um, who else is there right now? And Databox really, uh, really quick to jump in. Databox mm -hmm. also does a really, really great job of pulling in uh, professionals into whatever the, yeah. the content theme is of the day. Hey, what's your take? Uh, you know, they'll ask 10, uh, 10 operators uh, in relevant industries and, you know, get, get insights to share with their audience. Yeah, they're, they're really good at that. Yeah, like, like they're really good at pulling in that community and elevating other voices. Um, if you've both yeah. heard of them, now I'm, I need to check them out. So <laughs> I'm, on, I'm, I'm on Databox's website somewhere. We've done a couple. Uh, I've, I'm, the a only, couple I'm the only one who hasn't seen this. Now I have FOMO, so I will have to check this out. <laughs> um, yeah, well, if they're, uh, their head of marketing there is John Benini. You might have seen his content on LinkedIn. Um, but like also an awesome content marketer who like also got a, kind of came up through like journalism originally and then turned into like pivoted to content marketing. So he like, he knows how to make good content. <laughs> we appreciate our journalist friends joining the dark side. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, yeah. And then also, oh, I just wanted to also say like, and I, I, I love Trung fans work. <laughs> I just I think he's, he's hilarious. Cracks me up. I don't know how he does it. He is a content machine. Um, and I know he's a, he's a person, not a brand, but like, you know, he has his startup that he's building his work with Bloomberg, his own, like his own, uh, newsletter, right? Like he's, I don't know how he does it. Casey, I'll DM him. The podcast is killer too. The, oh, the, yeah, podcast the podcast is non-investment advice, uh, with, uh, Bilal and Jack. Oh, hilarious. But the, they, then they get these, they'll do like, a. When when I see like Trung's Trung's work, it kind of reminds me of uh, old school Rand, where you know just ten x, just go ham on one topic. Like I think there's a last thing about like Warren Buffett's like McDonald's meal, and he did like an elaborate post, and uh, <laughs> it was informative, entertaining, and delightful all at the same time. But like, um, yeah, can can we can we jump to that topic? Ten x. Yeah. yeah. Is that <laughs> Um, cause I, that's one thing that I noticed about you, Amanda, is like when you do the threads, it, I, I almost feel like there's a spirit of 10 Xing, including 10 X, like the quality of uh, materials in, you know, the, whatever the delivery mechanism at the time is, um, can you kind of share about how you think about, uh, creating high quality content, for example, since you do it so well, and uh, a lot of us can, uh, learn from you. Yeah. You know, maybe I'll say <laughs> it takes me a really long time to write something. And I'm also kind of lazy. So when I spend time on something, I really, really want to make sure that it is that thing is working as hard for me as possible. So I try to make sure that everything I do has multiple purposes. And that kind of cuts to the core of what I mean when I say like high quality content or making sure content is high quality. It's I think high quality content, what we're, what we're really trying to say when we talk about that is if it makes an impact on your business or your brand, right? And I think the ways that we could track that are if, if you're getting multiple utility or multiple use cases out of the content that you're creating, like, is it serving multiple marketing functions? And if it is, 
there's a good chance that it's high quality, right? Because if something was shitty, you wouldn't have much use for it, right? So that's what I'm going for when I'm whenever I create something new, a blog post, a newsletter edition, whatever it is. Um, and I think I've seen that like it, then it just kind of pays dividends, right? Like I'll, I'll spend maybe like eight to 10 hours writing a blog post. It's, it might be like 1500 to 2000 words spends, takes a lot of my time, but then that thing becomes, re, I repurpose it for top of funnel channels where it becomes standalone, becomes it's zero click content. Um, oftentimes it's content that I derive from a podcast or like from a webinar that I did where maybe I'll give a presentation on a topic and then I'll kind of see how the audience reacts to it, what questions they have, where, where they poke holes. And then I'll go back and like rethink it and polish it up a bit more. And that becomes the blog post. So I see these things as sort of playing into each other and feeding the rest of the marketing functions. So I, I'd love to... Um ask a question from the other side of the table for a minute, because we've talked a lot about what brands can do, but I, there's a lot of young people who want to be an online creator for a living. And mm -hmm. I think a question that isn't asked enough, and you're a great person to ask this to because you sat in the shoes of a brand marketer um, and consulted with many of them, is if I am a creator and I want sponsorship from say a Fitbit, um, like, what are the steps that I can do if I'm, say, really good at creating memes and threads and getting attention and, you know, I've, I've built enough of a, you know, top of funnel for myself? Like, like maybe share some ideas for getting into the head of an Amanda sitting on the client side to get that brand to sponsor me. Oh, that's interesting. Um, maybe I would I would say, like, ask yourself, can you sell that product? Like, can you, right? You, you can test it for yourself by um, seeing like what you can get people to convert on for free, right? Like maybe if, let's use like the Fitbit example of like fitness, health, wearable tech. Um, if you as a content creator have like productized one of your own pieces of content, maybe it's an ebook or a template, right? A meal planning template, right? Could be kind of anything. Can you get people to convert to that? And if you can, that means you can probably sell the product. So I think I, I think I would start there, like testing it by seeing if you can get people to convert in that relevant niche. Um, I might even suggest try testing some paid products, like even if it's like, like you know, like a ten dollar meal planning template or exercise schedule, something like that to see if like are like one are people convert for free, but two. Will they convert or will they actually pay for the thing? And then you'll start to see you can then you're, you're in a stronger position to kind of pitch yourself for sponsorships. Um, I think a lot of times when you're exploring sponsorships, I think most like uh, savvy marketers will know like they can't always expect immediate conversion. Right. But they also want to see they also want the needle to be moved in some kind of way. So think about things like. Um, how you can guarantee some kind of level of engagement. Uh, you could give examples of like, hey, like when I did, when I sold my ebook, I sold this many or like whatever that is um, to kind of prove why you deserve or like why they should spend with you. Um, and then I also just think there's something to be said for saying like, hey, you know what? Can't, um, can't guarantee at this time how many people will buy your product, but I can guarantee this many impressions. And based on this cost per impression, I think this price is fair. They could also reference this podcast and tell the brand about zero click content. They could, they could do that. <laughs> Be like, I'm, I'm going to tell you about this way. You're going to use social so much better by not <laughs> worrying about these pesky clicks. Now we're going to build your brand, you know? Um, <laughs> Yeah, but de-risking is, I mean, essential. Yeah. If, like going into any engagement, you know, bring your numbers. I totally echo that sentiment. I, I like that a lot too, especially if you if you can show, like show a couple conversions, be like, look, you know, I, I shared this for fun one time and, you know, I, I saw, you know, five of my friends bought it. I, I think that's that's probably proof enough that some brand should should take a gamble on you. Um does Spark Toro have a product for that, by the way? If I'm an individual creator, can I look at brands or is it only brands looking at people? 
Uh, what do you mean? Wait, looking at brands. Like, could I, is there a product for an individual creator to look at brands that sponsor people? Oh, no, there that'd is not. Cool, that'd probably be a cool <laughs> thing. You could do both yeah. sides of the trade there. Yeah, that'd be kind of cool. Um, so speaking of Sparktoro and new product ideas, can you tell us, because we have so many people listening who know Rand Fishkin, uh, can you tell us what it's like to work with Rand and maybe a few things no one knows if you could say anything? <laughs> Believe it or not, he is even nicer and kinder than you would think he would be. Like, I, I it's not that I didn't think he would be, <laughs> but whatever you see online, he's a lot nicer, like, in real life <laughs> as a human. I think, like, uh, I think some people think that, well, I think right, Rand and I have a lot in common. So there's, there's that. Like, there are, there are a lot of like personality quirks that we share um, and we have similar communication styles, but he's nicer than I am. <laughs> I also hear that you're both foodies and in fact that you have a bit of a professional food background and you were on another podcast I was listening to where you stopped short of sharing some culinary tips for us. So like, like, can you give us, can we do something fun? That's a little off brand. Yeah. Can, can, we, can we like share an easy, um, like, is there a cooking tip for marketers? Like, is there a way I can make a guac better? Some like easy secret. Like, do you have a few like cooking tips for us so we can all go make like the same thing this weekend? Um, <laughs> I love that. Um, well, the cooking tip or the thing that I've been doing, okay, this is like so off brand, <laughs> like off topic. <laughs> But I feel like, Adam, you might like this or you might hate this so much. Okay, so I'm really weird. And sometimes I like to really comb through my expenses <laughs> and, like, really dig into, like, do I really want to spend money on this thing? Or where can I save money? Like, it's fun for me. Like, some of my friends think I'm ridiculous and stupid. And they're just like, you are wasting your time by price comparison across grocery stores. And I'm like, no, this is my passion. <laughs> You don't understand. I, I I I think it is fascinating that in my city, uh, Greek yogurt, a, a tub of Greek yogurt at Whole Foods is five dollars, but it's nine dollars at a local like Ralph's or Vons or like Kroger or Safeway. That's wild to me. Like, why does it cost almost twice as much? So, I spent this month like comparing comparing prices. But the tip I have comes out of the tip is try to cook like when you're doing your meal planning for the week or like menu planning, um, try to stick with a cuisine each week because it makes oh, it a little bit, it makes it a little bit cheaper, a little bit more economical because you know, when you buy like a bunch of cilantro, for instance, you don't always need that for one meal. Usually you're like, Oh, like I, I, I have now I have to, I need to use this in the next week or so. And that bunch of cilantro probably is applicable to like three or four meals in a given week. So if you think about like planning your meals and cuisines, you can make different dishes each night. Um, I think you'll save money. You also like save the cognitive load of like, what am I going to make this week? And yeah, and I'm on track to like cut my grocery budget in half this month. Awesome. I think everyone is, I think everyone is interested in that. You know, when you started talking about pricing of Greek yogurt, you reminded me of a startup idea that I had that no one has done. And if someone in marketing is listening, please make this, you should use AdQuick and SparkToro to market it if you make this. But my idea is a startup called Only Brands, where it's just brands and they post coupons, BOGOs, offers, and you follow brands to get discounts and there's nothing else. And you can, you know, there's an app and you can scan the QR code at the grocery store, the CVS or the restaurant. And um, anyway, I, I want no this. One, and then it, we could remove brands from organic social and they could like just post their offers there. And <laughs> you could like maybe take market share from uh, other places. I'm telling you, people love couponing. I love couponing too. I As a marketer, it. the yeah. best part of the newspaper is the coupon section. Yeah, 100%. it's the best. I love it. Uh, I feel like I should give another food tip. Um when, I could jump. When, oh, was that? Oh, I said I could jump in. I could jump in with one if you if you need an extra one handy. Yes, go. Um, <laughs> add a half a stick of butter to everything. 
Uh, oh, that my, too. My, <laughs> my, my, my sister works in industry, and that's basically the cheat code for anything. Is that yeah. why everything out tastes so good? Yes. Yeah. And, and lots of salt. salt. Yeah, extra salt. So there's that. Uh, I'm going to say my other, my other tip is going to be like when it comes to plating, um, you can like instantly improve how your dish looks and by extension how it tastes because, you know, you, you eat with your eyes too by just adding more texture to your plate, like texture and contrast, right? Like, like nice dishes. They, they look nice because you might get, it might be a bowl of soup. But there's always some kind of texture on top, like green onions sprinkled over, fried onions sprinkled over, even just like a pinch of like a freshly cracked black pepper that adds like an element of texture and contrast to it. It's interesting because so you're, you are you have a food professional background. And so you look at it very much when you talk about texture. It's very much an art form. Whereas me as the utilitarian person who's not a sophisticated foodie, I'm just like, well you know, put the turkey sandwich together and I'll look at it. But you're saying, wait, add this extra texture and detail and maybe treat it as a, a, a almost ritualistic, right? Yeah. And it'll taste better. Cause then you'll like taste the crunch of the like fried garlic you add. Delicious. Well, I'm, I'm so glad we could talk about something in addition to marketing since we spent about 20 minutes talking about the importance of marketers to actually be a little bit authentic and human and, um, I'm learning such insight into you about um, going and finding the best deal on Greek yogurt. Um, <laughs> it, it is funny. You can you can tell you live in a city when your Whole Foods is cheaper than a local grocer because that does not happen where we are in Texas. Uh -huh. The Whole Foods is the most expensive here. So you can tell tell us you live in California without telling us you live in California. <laughs> it's probably true in New York as well. Probably. Probably. And also, you know, GPT wrote those tips, so... Wait, you use GPT on our on our podcast right no, now? No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I was like, wow, that was fast. I didn't even hear her type. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, did you have any other questions for Amanda while we have her on marketing, cooking, or anything else? Um, I don't. Uh, I think we ran through the ones that I want to touch on, which are uh, the oh oh I got I have one I have one good one. So. Uh, one thing that I find absolutely fascinating is the amount of output that your team does, uh, given that you are four, uh, four, three, three or four individuals. <laughs> That's wild. Them. They punch way above yeah. their weight. Bonker. <laughs> absolutely insane. How, uh, what, can you walk us through like how you think about uh, interacting across different functions of the business or functions of marketing? Oh. And uh, like, what does that look like for you? Is it, are you agency heavy do you outsource stuff? Do you have virtual assistants? Like, kind of, how do you how do you maintain such both quality and quantity consistently with such a small team? Yeah, um, let's see. In, in a way, it's easier to stay consistent when you're small because you have fewer stakeholders, right? You have fewer approvers. Um, I think what we're good at is we really focus on, uh, and it's usually. It's usually Rand and me who are doing the marketing, right? But we, we're really good at focusing on what we're best at and then outsourcing the rest. So we do work with some agencies and consultants. Like we've worked with uh, the team at Forget the Funnel for improving some of our onboarding flows. Like they went through, they went through our, our flows, it did a bunch of customer interviews, and then gave us some advice on what to do next. So with that, I went and like redid um, – our email onboarding flows. Like we rewrote the copy, made a new sequence that was behavior based. So like we do work with consultants and agencies agencies on a lot of like, hey, what do we do next on the growth side? Um, and we're now working with Asia Arangio at Demand Maven on some growth marketing opportunities for us. So kind of the next step of like after the onboarding flow, what should we optimize or fix next? Um, and as far as what, what we are really good at, what Rand and I are good at is content creation. So for me, like I know that my time is going to be better spent writing a really good blog post versus trying to, you know, do something super like a techie on the product side. I'm not a tech person, right? Like that's Casey's job. But I just mean like when I focus on what I do best, then that's better for the business. And then we kind of outsource as needed. Awesome. Um, I'm sure getting to work with you and Rand is quite the uh, 
you know, quite the bar because you guys are, your, your level of quality is very high. So I'm sure your consultants are, are, are really good. Um, Amanda, we usually don't do this, but you're such a great marketer and we're such fans. We're going to throw it to you if you have any questions for us. Oh my gosh. Yes. This is fun. Well, I don't, I don't really get out of home. Like I don't have a lot of experience in it, but I know it's super impactful. So what would you say to somebody who's like, Hey, I think I want to try some of this stuff, but I don't know how to start or like, I understand you have to spend a lot of money <laughs> or maybe that's not even true. Like what are some ways you can understand how you should be viewing the ROI of it? I'll let Chris take this. Sure. Um, so, you know, a lot uh, our early customers have historically been performance marketers that are, um, you know, seeing saturation with their walled garden channels, uh, their digital first channels. And so, you know, we take a similar approach, test, measure, scale. But I think when you when you a, a, approach out of home, it's good to know that it is a real estate asset first and then advertising place placement second. So what that means is uh, you can your dollar goes a lot further in a city like Nashville than it does in a city like New York. Right. So if you want to make a splash in Manhattan, you know, 150 grand for four weeks uh, might not even make a dent. Right. So it's it's very important to understand a the composition and makeup of the media in the in the market, understand how those CPMs compare to other markets. And then now with technology, we can basically take any first party or third party data, layer it onto the map and find and index all the inventory based on the highest propensity to be a fit with your audience. So, I mean, we'll start with, you know, smaller scale bets in, hey, this is my audience, but let's try this in, you know, Chattanooga or let's try this in uh, Chicago as opposed to like a San Francisco or a Seattle or a New York. And um, the nice thing is with, you know, the right tools you can uh, and going back to our discussion about how, you know, those zero click moments, how uh, out of home primes an audience. It really gives the marketer an opportunity to flood the top of the funnel. Um, and assuming that, you know, your digital uh, properties are well, well designed and your conversion rates are accurate, you can really see a tremendous impact and lift uh, and use some of those R acronyms that, you know, historically have been reserved for digital channels. Like, you know, we, we can now we're now at a place where we could calculate your return on ad spend for an out of home campaign. This is something that wasn't doable in a few, uh, you know, two years ago. Mm -hmm. And so knowing that, A, it's good to start small before you start lighting money on fire, like start buying, investing in, in larger uh, campaigns. But the, the cool thing is all of your digital touch points and the impacts of odd, the out of home on those digital channels is now measurable. So like. We'll have, you know, consumer product goods companies like D2C apparel companies. Let's, co let's call it at like a hundred dollar price point. They'll come in and they'll be like, OK, we're, we're going to run in five markets. What impact did this have on my search? And then you can see like, OK, how did this bolster my organic traffic in that market? And then you could basically see all the downstream impacts as well. So um, my recommendation is like in terms of how to get started is start small and you know, think about, uh, you know, whether you can succinctly convey your value proposition in a very short amount of time, because uh, out of home is a medium that lends itself to that, right? So like, you don't want a paragraph on a billboard, you want a couple words or something very clever and delightful, uh, that maybe takes up four or five words as opposed to having, uh, you know, the Gettysburg address there on on a, on a piece of advertising. And if you are a purely digital marketer, and you've never advertised in um, out of home. The cool part of using AdQuick is we've made it it's easy to run as a PPC campaign. So if you can run a Facebook campaign or a GDN campaign, you can upload your creative, you can you know choose your audiences, and you can set your budget. Um, you can run an out of home campaign. It's actually as easy. And that's one of the cooler parts of our product. Uh, before I was at AdQuick, um, I was at various companies where we wanted to do, we wanted all the billboards, or at least some of them around an event space, because mm -hmm. we wanted everyone to already be thinking of us when they went into the event and reinforce our speakers and whatnot. 
And it used to require you to have to call like three or four different companies and like find out what was available. They send you a PDF back, big pain in the butt. And so what we've done is instead of having to call a bunch of vendors, you can find your inventory in one tool. You can see what's open. You can, you know, buy your inventory, make sure it's there. And then you can actually measure it with really sophisticated measurement tools. Um, you know, you, you can even get like sampled foot traffic, right. To actually understand how many people even see that billboard. Right. So you can get like the same sort of directional data that you can get with online display. And so, yeah, it's if, like traditional marketers understood everything Chris said, but mm -hmm. if you were just a digital marketer, um, you know, out of home is now pretty much as easy to run as a digital ad. And I think that's, that's like probably the, the barrier in people's heads for running it. Cause yeah. it's like, Oh, we're all so used to just doing everything in a, in a single tool. Well, you can do that now. Yeah. Mm. And just to add to that, Amanda, like in an, you know, for, for all of our listeners, you know, we're, we're now reaching a world where, uh, the CPM is on the, the walled gardens are getting uh, very expensive, cost prohibitive for some businesses that have to achieve a certain gross profit or gross margin on their on their goods, especially D2C companies. And so what you what you see is uh, arbitrage and reallocation of marketing investment towards something that's a five dollar CPM versus a forty five dollar CPM. So um, a lot of opportunity because. You know, uh, historically, it's been an underutilized channel. And, uh, you know, we're, we're now getting into that world where omni-channel is no longer a dirty word. And like I said, the four Ps are coming back to prominence, you know. Well, awesome. Um, thank you for that question. You yeah. really teed us up to hype. <laughs> Hell yeah. It. Thank no, you. No, I, I think I really, I'm genuinely interested. Yeah. And I, I just think like, I've, I, it just also reminded me of like, in my D to C past that we just did the little of the like non-digital opportunities that we were like, does this work? And it worked extremely well. Like the one that I would share is, um, I think it's still around, you know, sunset magazine. Yeah, I do. That magazine. It's on like every like doctor's office. Yep. We did like an, uh, like a full page ad in it. It converted for like years. Like it was. Yeah, it, still, it, it might still want to be on that desk in the office. <laughs> it might still be there, but it was extremely effective that we were like, people read this. But it was like, it's, I mean, it, it, it to me is like an out of home ad in the sense that it's, a, it's an artifact, right? It's, it's, it's a thing that is out in the real world and often just sitting on, in, on office coffee tables and stuff. So it's like almost like a billboard in, in a sense, right? Um, and it was just amazing how it was this thing that like none of us read and we we're like, well, you know, understand like just because we don't read it doesn't mean that it's not good, right? But we were just kind of blown away by like, dang, like that was a really good use of money. <laughs> I, I think there's probably an argument to be made like the the highest level of influencer marketing would be some sort of offline meetup where you get people together for, yeah. you know, a brand or a happy hour or something like that. I think when you're when you're able to do that and take that online conversation offline, um, that's a really special thing. Um, you know, we see it in our industry, in the marketing industry, you know, Amanda, you've spoken at many events that you were invited to from your online participation, right? So um, I do think in the future, which we're starting to live in, there won't be so much this distinction between offline and online. We'll, 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 we'll see it as kind of all the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, we'll get to a place where all of it could be orchestrated online, just despite where the audience connects with the piece of advertising. And then eventually we'll have out of home ad on influencers. We'll be able to, I, I want to like, you know, have someone be able to buy an out of home ad on, on my shirt. You don't want to hear what <laughs> some people were saying about running out of home ads um, on, on people in my feed the other day, but I, I still have a whole right arm that we could tattoo up. <laughs> <laughs> we get, uh, we get a big spark Toro. I could be a B2B software influencer. You, you, gave, me a, you gave me a great idea, by the way. <laughs> So thank you for that. You need to wear a tablet or something, Chris. You, you can't, eventually you're going to run out of space. <laughs> It'd be like the million dollar body. Remember the million dollar homepage where the guy was selling a dollar yep. a pixel? And yep. Anyway. Well, thank you, Amanda. Um, just to wrap up, where can people go to find you online? Yeah. So to, to find me, um, I'd say just go to my personal site, amandanet.com. My newsletter's there. My socials are there. It's also 
like my handle on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. Um, and then for SparkToro, just check us out at sparktoro.com. You can make a free account where you get 50 SparkToro searches per month. So yeah. Awesome. And for all people who were forward to this and didn't subscribe yet, um, please join us and subscribe so you don't miss future episodes in the link below. And we will see everyone next week. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Amanda. Yeah, thank you.